They got the Uluru statement there. <laughs> That's why I say of God. The Uluru statement was already written, so um, it's not worth the paper it's written on. And they put that statement in the middle after everybody signed it, so people had no idea what they were signing. Um, and it's, <coughs> it's, it's an offence against me, and it's a, an offence against a lot of our people, that were a statement. Yeah. And those black trackers with the new form of guns are betraying us, yeah? and betraying us big time. They're paid by the mining companies. In fact, $800 million went into that reconciliation, that whole process to get to that bloody document. And it was paid for by BAP, Rio Tinto, and many other companies like it um, to get there. And um, yeah, <clears throat> it's not a document that um, I associate with, my mob associate with. And I dare say, uh, when people look at the background of those who, who uh, were participating in organizing that, you'll be shocked to realise that they're the same people who gave away land rights um, on Aboriginal people after the scarce of Marble. And um, that's what I will focus on, not that bloody old statement. <coughs> um, Marble, of course, cheated us a little bit as well. Uh, the High Court <coughs> rested the law under themselves, all the judges, because they had to keep the power in the hands of the colonial supremacists, um, namely the lady who lives over there who's having all sorts of trouble now um, with her own family, um, Queen Elizabeth. And um, the sovereign of this country um, is in fact um, made up of 13 families. It's not made up of one. She's just the, the head of the sovereignty of England. England is made up of 13 families the most influential of them are German. And uh, they control the crown. And um, the crown of England, that is. And of course, Australia um, are a colony, continue to be a colony of England. Australia, they argue, and Michael Labash, now married to my crazy cousin, Louisa Barrett, um, and, um, and Gareth Evans, and. Bob Hawke went across to get the British Parliament to pass the Australia Act uh, to separate Australia from being a colony of England. But they didn't succeed, really. Um, if you know law and you know constitutional law and you know international law, you, I'm, by the way, I'm a non-practicing lawyer nowadays, but, um, but I know that system. Um, it's essential to understand that um, <coughs> that the Crown of England um, have the only claim of right to this country is his first discoveries. They only discovered this place by, under the Western system after the Pope had written the international law through the papal bulletins to settle the conflict of the Armada that was happening between Spain and uh, France and, um, and England in the English Channel, you know, fighting over land, as usual. And so um, this power that was happening at the time, they had to, uh, before they killed each other and killed themselves and, um, and took all the trees down to build boats, um, which is why all the trees in England disappeared. Um, that amongst other things. <coughs> um, the Pope was asked to um, mediate the dispute. And so the Pope then wrote these laws. And the Pope divided the world. A world that at the time they were debating whether it was flat or round. Yeah. And of course, everybody then asked, how the hell did the Pope know how to divide the world up, this planet? Because after all, he hadn't been past Spain and he hadn't been past Rome. Everything in between was the world. <clears throat> and maybe the, um, um, the Mediterranean Sea. But he did it, he divided the world. And so when we look back on it, we track down and find out that our old mate Genghis Khan and 
um, all those blokes who were raiding England at the time, um, took some of the maps that China had already um, done in, what is it, 1421, there's a thing where the China with the junk boats, mainly the um, Ming Dynasty, had travelled the world <coughs> and mapped the continents. They mapped the islands, they mapped Australia. Well before the British, 300 years before they even got anywhere near us. Yeah. We had a relationship with the Chinese. There was a diplomatic agreement. They'd pull up water and animals and food as they were passing and mapping other places. And so, <coughs> of course, what helped this was the fact that people like Genghis Khan and others went right through raiding um, Europe because they knew they could go there. There was nothing in between. But foolishly, they left behind the map. And, uh, you know, the Churches got rid of, got hold of that map, and then they ended up realizing that okay, there is um, all these other places. So they knew, and that's how the Europeans got to know when you really look at that. And um, so yeah, so they should all thank China for letting that fellow take the map there. Otherwise, they'd be still thinking the world's flat. Um, the fact that they came here and they divided the world, and the Pope uh, managed to manipulate an agreement in place. Um, they divided the world up, and the Dutch, the Spanish, Portuguese, um, then started going around, claiming all these countries. One of the um, um, papal bulletins said that you are to take the land of heathens and pagans. And when you look at the English dictionary for the word pagan, it just means land dwellers. So um, that's a bit of a bit of a crazy one, that one, because um, they said that if these people had belief in another god or a, or a god, according to the papal bulletins, then you were not allowed to take the lands from those people. But if they didn't believe in a god, have a, um, some sort of deity that um, similar to the European and Roman god um, and the Judeo-Christian god, and I've been told by the Jewish people, do not say Judeo-Christian rule because they screwed it all up and they told lies and misrepresented the Torah and other things. So I do not say Judeo-Christian rule, I take that back. Um, I remind myself when I said it. Um, and so when you look at these things, they said, well, if they didn't, if you find lands where other people have similar gods and belief in gods, well, then you can't take their lands. You have to negotiate. So they came to Australia. Many moons later, in the 1800s, when they started going after your mob, the uh, Radjuri and Ellie's husband's mob, um, the Radjuri, um, they sent a little man out here called Charles Darwin to Australia. And um, his first port of call was Kangaroo Island. And when he got to Kangaroo Island, he went there to watch ceremony. And he watched them perform kangaroo and emu dance and dances to other animals and birds, etc. And then they took him to Bathurst when he left Kangaroo Island. And uh, he watched ceremony there with the people around Bathurst. And again, they did kangaroo dance, emu dance, other dances. He went back to England and he reported to the parliament in England that the Aboriginal people were animists. That is, they believed in animal gods. They did not have a god like European. And therefore, <clears throat> deep down, then that established in the canon law that Aboriginal people did not have a God similar to theirs. And therefore, um, our beliefs were in between um, evolution. We were still evolving from the uh, dream time and stone age into modernity where we were able to develop an attitude and develop the skills of being able to till the soil and settle farms, and etc. Um, now, we still have a lot of that conflict now going on because there's a lot of research in this area by people as a result of, what do they call it, the Dark Emu by PASCO, and um, people are now starting to look at Aboriginal people and Aboriginal society. Anyway, all of a sudden, you know, there's this modern day evolutionary process they tried to breed us out of existence. We all know that. I don't need to go through all that for you. Um, they slaughtered us. I don't have to go into that for you. 
think you've heard all that. But one thing that I do want to um, just say to you now, and that is that um, Marvo, the decision in Marvo, um, was quite interesting. In fact, Marvo, the decision in Marvo, raised more questions than it gave answers when you really look at it. And, um, and when I say that the decision in the court, and I said this earlier, that the court and the judge have wrested the law unto themselves, um, they actually perform and act out a racially discriminatory decision. Yeah. When they said, um, in that case, um, that they could not sway and be influenced by modern law and be influenced by um, the laws of today that are just and that deal with human rights. Because, you see, had they gone down that road and looked at our rights from a common law perspective, then, of course, Australia is not owned by any white fellow in this country at all. Not one block of land. That includes all these blocks in Sydney and everywhere else. And, quite frankly, they still don't own it. And um, it's the elephant in the room when it comes to Aboriginal land rights in this country. And um, there have been some subsequent decisions as a result of Mabo. And um, I will take you to them very shortly. But the other point that I have to make about Mabo, whilst they said they could not, um, what's the correct terminology, Ellie? Um, could not go with modern contemporary, contemporary notions of justice in the modern world to make their decision, they completely ignored the international um, norms at that time when they made that decision. And so they made a discriminatory decision saying that Aboriginal people's rights were only those that were left behind and there were traces of them, of these rights, but that any laws that were made by the parliaments after the 1824, when they started setting up the legislature in New South Wales in particular, um, then those laws that happened after that and the granting of land to non-Aboriginal people, then supposed to at least ex um, extinguish our rights to land. <coughs> to that I say bullshit. And we have the legal, we have the legal backing to say that's bullshit. Now, Marbo, um, if I was to sit here and analyse every aspect of Marbo for you, you will all be shocked at that decision. Absolutely shocked. One in particular was that they say that the Australians gained a tenure. Yeah, the colonialists obtained a tenure. And they actually say a tenure of some kind. Now here you have a full bench of the High Court of Australia not being able to tell us categorically what type of land tenure it was. Yeah? None. It's actually said in the judgment. So when we look at that, we say, okay, what does tenure mean? What is it? And so We've now been able to analyse it to the point where the tenure they talk about is merely a registered title on a registered document of surveyed land. And that registration of title just gives people title to, I think, six foot or nine foot of soil. That's it. You are nothing else. So in effect, you have a land title that's called an in a colonial land use title. That's all you have. And then of course you have, they place a real estate value one of these days, you know, so you all feel wealthy when you got title to land. You know, yeah, the elephant in the room is coming. And we will get our just desserts. And I'll tell you how we get our just desserts. Marbo said how we can do it. Now, the claim to the Crown 
Mabo said that the Australian colonies were settled by way of a feudal uh, system. But feudalism disappeared out of England the, in 1660. And so the feudal rights were pretty restricted and pretty limited rights, even for England, um, then and now. And so we investigate this whole concept of feudalism and what does feudalism mean. So basically it means that when they claimed the land, all the land that was on this continent um, was now owned by a man in England living in Buckingham Palace. Yeah? And so he claimed title and ownership. And of course there was a case where um, a white man, a settler called uh, Bateman, or Batman, um, not the Batman we watch on TV these days, but the other Batman, the real Batman. Um, he did a deal with the Aboriginal people down there, Melbourne, around Geelong area. And of course, I think it was Governor Darling, panicked and said, no, that cannot be. I am going to wash, wash that um, arrangement between those people because the only person that they can deal with is the Crown of England who holds title to this land under a feudal system, because they own it. And so the Aborigines don't own it. Now, that is until Mabo. Now, Mabo then messed us up again. But Mabo gave us a little, there were some clues in Mabo that we need to look at very closely. Mabo left a trail of clues. And I don't know whether it was deliberate or was it by accident. But if you understand the maze and you're able to look at how it deals with this, one thing that is for certain, and that is Mabo showed to the Crown of Australia and England, that you do not have a beneficial title to this country. That's a decision by the full court of the Australian government, of the Australian High Court. So what does that mean? It means this. Beneficial title means that the Crown does not own the land proper. And so the Crown have only a limited ability to be able to grant interest in land. And in particular, the one that I focus on a lot with Aboriginal people is the native flora and fauna, and also the minerals, rights, and water. And so the position is that with mineral rights, if they didn't get a beneficial title to the land, then they don't have rights to issue mining tenements. They don't have rights to issue water ownership in this country. They don't, because they don't have a beneficial title, and that's stated in Mabo. Now, why did Mabo say that? Mabo said it because of a court case in 1847 called Attorney General versus Brown. This is where a little white fellow was given some a block of land up in the Hunter Valley, and he's living on it, and um, what he did, he found some coal. So he started digging the coal up, and he started selling it to his mates, didn't he? He wanted to make some money. So they took him to court and said, you don't have a right to sell the, sell the coal because we, the Crown owns it. We're the only ones who can sell it. We're the only ones who can give that license. And if you want to get it, you have to get permission from us. Now, Mabo said that was fiction. That whole concept was fiction. Not only that, the 1847 case said it was also fiction. And it was based on the premise that Australia had this feudal system in place. And of course, the decision, final decision in that judgment of 1847 in the New South Wales Supreme Court was that um, if they stuck to that, then they were dangerous ideas, you know, because um, feudalism was a fictitious notion applied to the settlement of Australia. That was the decision in that court case. And, they, and, and then they go through and make, mess out a whole number of other things, and then they finally get down to saying, quote, citing why that's fictional and why it's dangerous to think that they had full ownership, the Crown had full ownership, beneficial title. When you read the case, Attorney General versus Brown, 1847, 
you'll see in there where they say, well, this is a fictitious notion because if it's left in the hands of the ancient owners, it changes everything completely because they are the first possessors. So we have greater rights than the first finders, the first discoverers, because we actually possessed it. Now our problem is that a lot of our people have not been able to articulate what ownership looks like to us under our law and culture. Yeah. I wear this red headband because I spend a lot of time out in the bush doing ceremony. And ceremony is not an easy thing to do, proper ceremony. Yeah. Not that gam and microwave ceremony they do these days. Yeah. Um, and, and so I, I've been around this country, I've been into all over doing ceremony because I now am a senior lawman. That gives me the right to wear this. Okay. A lot of people wear headbands I see all over the place, but they got no bloody idea what it means. You know, it's a lot of work to do. You have to have a lot of knowledge. And you learn that. You learn that very, very hard. It's not an easy thing to do. And you get names and you get titles just like white people do in universities and other places. You do get titles, you get to know things, and you get your position in that society. And so you become a lock wash lawman. Yeah, the equivalent of what they would do in England would be then to crown, or in Europe, to crown you a king. But we don't have kings, we just have lawmen. Yeah. We have senior lawmen. We have different people at different levels, right? And so not everybody has certain have those powers to speak for country or speak for law. In this case, I'm talking about a white man's law, and I'm also talking about our law now, because our law is superior to the white law in this country. And the way in which that's superior is by reason of celestial law. And when you talk about celestial law, I'm talking about we got our law from the creation. Now, the only other people who can, who can relate to that, well, there are, there are, I know, four people, four groups of people who can do that. One is the ancient Chinese. The second one is a special group of people native to India, mainland India, who have very strong ties to ancient laws, sky gods. We talk about those same thing, the creation. They came from up there. Yeah, they created us. We know how that happened. We talk about it. And the other people that I have spent a bit of time learning from, the Jewish people. Now, the thing that everybody talks about, this Judeo-Christian rule that is set in place, that the Jews keep telling me, they bastardized it. The Christians bastardized the whole teaching and wrote that book called the Bible. Yeah. Now, I don't mean to offend anybody who are practicing Christians, but I merely say this. You need to find out how they use that against us to deny us our rights, because they have. They've used that against us in a big way. Now. <clears throat> So let me come to celestial law. So celestial law is higher than any other law. And of course, that's where the Christians get their teachings from, other people get their teachings from. And you see, so if you go into law and you go into Christian faith or some sort of religious spiritual teachings, you separate the two. So the common law and the laws that are made for your society and how you live comes from a common law. If you have common practices. That's how you live your society, that's how you're used to doing things and everything else, even though it's all screwed up these days. Your grandparents really fucked it up, quite frankly. Um, the, that system operates by parliament, regulating systems on how you live, how you, what sort of economy we have, how you develop the land, and all that sort of stuff. And you fellows voted me in to do all that for years. Okay? Now, 
When you then come over here to celestial law and to Christian law, this comes from the spirit, from the creation. No man, parliament, or, or, par or courtroom system, have anything to do with this Christian law over here, this canon law. That's why you have the separation of the church and society and parliament and the legal system. So, we have, as Aboriginal people, we do not understand, I'm trying to educate as many as I can now, to say how we are not subject to that Western law because we operate and come from a different system altogether. And in Mabo, Mabo made one point in there that nobody's really focused on. And that is, you cannot, or sorry, they say that Aboriginal law and custom uh, is not a construct of the common law system but the common law now recognises it. Yeah? So that separates our custom and tradition and religion and spirituality and our connection completely from the Western world. Completely. And so we move over into the white law and then they add one more thing. And that is that when it comes to contesting those rights under those laws, and the white fellow's right to continue in Australia and make laws, when those two clash, no court in this country are permitted to deal with any of those matters. None. So when we have a conflict between Aboriginal law and white law here, whose law is superior, no court, not even the High Court in this country, are permitted to deal with that question. That's why they say it belongs to another jurisdiction. So what jurisdiction is that? There's only one that we know of, and that is the International Court of Justice in The Hague. But to get there, you need a lot of money. Yeah. Not whether you're right. It has nothing to do with right. It has whether it is about whether you've got enough money to get there. Yeah? So. Our position basically is that we have a very frustrating position in this country. Aboriginal people right now are being railroaded by an auto autocratic system that really don't give a shit about our rights. And they know that when we contest those rights, the courts are going to be stuck because they can't deal with it. So then where do we, where do we come together? All these foreigners and traders here want to bring it together through reconciliation. Bullshit, I've got nothing to reconcile. I have absolutely nothing to reconcile. Yeah? For I didn't do any wrong. They came here and took my land. I didn't come here and take anything. So, why should I sign up to a reconciliation program? Why should I say that, you know, I want to give these people any rights? That's why I don't. And we have a, a system now in place that <clears throat> causes us much frustration. Because we have the power, we just don't know how to, how to use it. We have more power than we realise as Aboriginal people, as First Nation people. And so I'm trying to educate our young ones Come and listen, for God's sake. Listen. Listen to what has been decided. Yeah? And I'll leave it open for questions, but I want to end by this. In February of 2020, there was another High Court case. And that High Court case was called Love, Commonwealth versus, or Love versus the Commonwealth and Tom's versus the Commonwealth. These are two Aboriginal people who had an Aboriginal mother who married in one instance, married a Papua New Guinean, moved to Papua New Guinea, and they had a child in Papua New Guinea. He came home and got recognised by his mother's people. The elders recognised him and accepted him in to the mob. 
The other fella was an Aboriginal woman who married a, uh, a New Zealander. Yeah, He came home and he wanted to be recognised by his people. So he went out and he found his mother's people. First time ever, and they accepted him into the mob. Yeah? As family. The Australians then picked those two guys up, the Home Affairs Office, and picked them up and put them in detention and said they had to be deported back to New Zealand and be deported back to Papua New Guinea because they were citizens of those two countries. So they challenged the, high, they challenged the system and in the end they won the court case. And in that court case they confirmed what two politicians said, one Labour and the Prime Minister of Australia said in 1965. That was, Robert Menzies told the Parliament when they were debating um, the plebiscite, to put up the plebiscite for the 67 referendum that you all no doubt have heard about. Menzies, and Menzies was a QC, he was an international lawyer and a very well known one, both overseas as well as here. And Sir Robert Menzies said to the Parliament, he said, look, we're going to be only too happy to get rid of Section 127, and that is that barred Aborigines from being counted in the census, in the population, uh, determining the population of this country, because we were banned by Section 127 from being included. But he also said that um, if we are to take the word Aboriginal out of the Constitution, which and, and what it said was that the government has, you know, can make laws and good, for good governance and all that, and section 20, subsection 26 said, for any race for whom it is deemed necessary, but not the Aborigines of the state. Right? So, so we, we slotted in there. The 67 referendum said, no, let's get rid of Aborigines of the states. Now, that's all it did, that success of that referendum. It gave us nothing else. Didn't make us citizens, did not give us the right to vote. Anything like that. If they tell you anything differently, they're bullshitting to you. They're telling you lies. Reframing history to suit them. No, never said anything about that at all. So, what did that mean? It meant then that the Commonwealth could lay, make laws for any race. Now, now, they deemed Aboriginal people and Torres Strait Islander people to be a separate race from the colonials, from the British subjects, and other people who were Christian and, uh, what do you call it, um, sit when they give them their citizenship, yeah, colonised, I should say. Anyway, when you get your citizenship as foreigners and you became Australian, not one Aborigine has ever given that except under the old Aboriginal Protection Board laws. Under the Aboriginal Protection Board laws, which every state had, if you wanted to be free and have citizen rights, free rights to walk and shop and do whatever you want, there was a provision in each of those acts in the state for you to be able to apply for citizenship to Australia and become a British subject or an Australian citizen. And of course, when you applied for one of those, if you were successful, um, then they would give you a citizenship tag. It was a passport, like a passport. It was a, and you had to carry that with you all the time, just in case the police pick you up. Yeah? Because the police can then put you back in those gulags, in the prison camps. So you had to have it on you all the time. Now, when they granted you that, this is what it said. You are no longer an Aborigine for the purpose of the act. So in effect, when you got a dog tag, as we call them, you were no longer an Aborigine. You became a citizen of the Crown. Now, today, I ask the question, well, how can all them blackfellas there who gave up all that there and went away and now become part of native title claim, when in fact, they are no longer natives? They are British subjects. They gave it away a long time ago. They have no rights to a in a native title claim. And now I come back to Taunton Love and I explain why they don't have that right. 
Because in that court case, in the High Court, full bench of the High Court, it said, these men were neither citizens nor subjects, nor aliens. That's basically what they're saying. They're neither citizens nor aliens. So who the bloody hell are we? And what part of Australian society do we belong to? Yeah. And I recommend that you guys grab hold of that case. Tom, love. We can, if anyone wants to know, we can give it to you. Find out, read that case. And then it will shock you to realise that Aborigines are not citizens nor aliens in this country. We're not aliens because we are native to this country. We are the local inhabitants. So where does that put Aboriginal people? How do Aboriginal people fare in there? We still own every bloody thing in this country. We still own this land. The only reason we cannot assert that ownership is because we don't have a Navy, Air Force and an Army. If we had the size, two million, five million people, Australia would be very different right now. We don't, so we have to be smarter. Yeah. We have to be smarter. And so I'm telling you this because there is an elephant in this country that has to be dealt with. You can't push him under the carpet anymore. And there are court cases that are coming up now that are dealing with the truth, that are, are beginning to become brave about making the right decisions. And so I just simply say to you, watch this space. There's a lot to come. Okay, I'll leave it for questions. Questions? He ran away, that fellow looked. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm sorry, I'll go to another, another. Okay, for those of you brave enough, I'm... yeah? You can't tell me all of you understood that. No way in the world. You must have one question. Yes? Hey, I'm going to do that. Yeah. Um, the Torres Strait. Back in the days, in the Eddie Mobile Court, it's, about, it's all about the Commonwealth, is it? Which one? Commonwealth. The Commonwealth. Yes. Yeah. It's no. all under the Commonwealth Act. Where is that? The Torres Strait. The Torres Strait. The Torres Strait are quite separate, but they, um, the government has done a deal with Torres Strait and they set up a Torres Strait Island Authority. And the Torres Strait Island Authority um, basically is the recognised government of Torres Strait under an agreement with the Commonwealth of Australia. Yeah. And so the Torres Strait Islanders have that authority and they make all the decisions, they get a budget, they do their thing. And if they've given any land back to the government, well then I hope they got paid for it. I hope they didn't give it away, I hope they leased it yeah, and retained ownership of it. Um, but yeah, I quite honestly, I've, I've heard things about Torres Strait, but I'm not prepared to go into any discussion because I really don't know anything about it. But I can tell you they have a lot of power if they want to exercise that power. They're also mentioned, by the way, in a treaty between Papua New Guinea in terms of the border. Yeah? And so those border rights in that treaty between Australia and Papua New Guinea grants them a lot of power as well. Yeah. I saw someone, yeah. Um, I believe Gary Foley said native title is not land rights and I wonder what you think about the native title process that comes out of Native title. Given the, what um, you said. Yeah. <laughs> no, 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 native title don't give land. That's it in a nutshell. They don't give land. Native title is a bundle of rights. Yeah? And that's the right to go around and hunt kangaroo, and look for emu eggs and chase emu and chase iguanas and maybe pick up a few native fruit and berries on land that someone will let you. Yeah. Um, when they give, um, they give this land that they say um, is, what, what's the correct term, um, exclusive title. The problem is they don't, that exclusivity does not prevent them from dealing with the government and, let, and the government can force their way in and grant mining on that, on that land even though it's exclusive ownership to theirs. But here's the other point. Native title do not give you a title to land. It does, it does not describe a tenure to the land. 
So when they, there's no registry of a tenure on the state's title registry, because it's not a title. It's their name only, nothing else. And that, and our people just don't realize the significance of that and how, yeah, we can't do anything with that land. We can't negotiate it, we can't sell it, yeah? And if we want to negotiate some big deal with development, we have to get permission from the government. Yeah? It's not ours to do. It's there in name only, that's it. Whereas common law, our common law rights, gives us the same rights as all other white citizens. And so we get a bit of a problem now, because Mabo says we're not citizens. I know Mabo, the Tom and Love case, okay. tells we're not citizens. So we don't have the same rights as citizens of Australia in terms of protecting our lands. We're going to test that. We, we, we're sort of on the way to do that. But it's, it's quite shocking, actually, to think that. And Gary's right, you know. We knew what we were doing when we were after land rights. Yeah, but, um, yeah, when we, when Marbo came down, yeah, those people that they brought down here, Noel Pearson and these cronies, Man, um, yeah, all of those people gave land rights away in favour of native title. Yeah. One day a semi trailer might run out of the bastards, pretty much. I thought. Yeah. Yeah, I thought uh, the native title would recognise. Aboriginal and Torres Strait Island the rights of land. True. Yeah. 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 The right to use a land. But if you look at the title when you go home, there's no title. There's none. There's none. It's called native title exclusive rights. Yeah. And um, when you look for the title on land registry, it just says native title. That's all it says. It has no land value. It's not worth anything. Um, you give a white man a block of land, it has a value. Native title Aboriginal land does not have an, um, a dollar sign attached to it. The land is not worth nothing. It's not worth anything. The reason being is that you can't transfer the land. You're banned from dealing with the land. You're banned from negotiating <coughs> and transferring that land. The only way in which you can make money on that land is to sell that native title interest on that land back to the Crown. That's the only way you can make money on that land. You can make money if you develop business and enter into private enterprise. You'll find that the government will sit right on your backside because they control that land through what they call a prescribed body corporate. And a prescribed body corporate is supposed to be made up of all the members of the uh, of the common law elders, the people whose names were listed as being um, part of that native title. And so all those people um, were to be members of that organisation. In Western Australia, quite frankly, um, they banned a lot of the old people, they banned a lot of people who were traditional owners from membership. They're still doing it. And they controlled millions and millions of dollars of royalty money. They control all the development with government, yeah. And so you can negotiate all those things, yeah, but you, you don't get 50%, you don't get 30%, you don't get anything like that in terms of natural resources on your country. You're only allowed, and the mining companies came together in 19, um, 1997, 1994. In, um, in, where was it, I think they said Amsterdam, somewhere. And, um, no, Copenhagen, pardon me. I know that because the lawyer at the time was a lawyer for Rio Tinto and she was married to my cousin, so I had people planted in the right places. And um, they were over there and the mining companies all came together and said, shit, Marvo happened, what do we do? How do we deal with Aboriginal people now? And so the mining companies came up with a, uh, an international agreement between all of them that um, they're, they're only prepared to negotiate up to 3% for 
for royalties for Aboriginal people. Any interest? There's only one group of people in this country that I know of who got 3%. And that was um, up there near Warman in, um, in the East Kimberley. Um, everyone else has got 0.05%, 0.2%, um, 0.1%, um, 0.75% of royalty for royalties of the money and they bring out billions of dollars yearly and of course the Aboriginal people are not allowed to own that money by the way that's another factor and a native title um, mining companies state government and Commonwealth government have three people sitting on every royalty um, trust and they have discretionary powers these three people non-Aboriginal people mind you and you also have these other big trust accounts, uh, trustees looking after Aboriginal trust accounts. Um, that's compulsory under the Native Title Act. And um, the biggest one that's operating in Australia at present is the Myers Foundation. And the Myers Foundation has subsidiary companies that now um, control trust accounts for Aboriginal people. And in the case of uh, one more, the Maru people of um, the great sandy desert in Western Australia. Um, they operate the trust account and they employ 45 white people in Melbourne to look after one trust account. And when they have a meeting with the Aboriginal people, it costs them a half a million dollars a day to have a meeting because they have to fly in in a plane, they hire a plane, they bring in policemen, they bring in security people, they bring in staff to have the meeting because they're frightened of the people that they're, trust, they're holding this trust money for. Um, it's, it's, it's criminal what's going on. It really is criminal. Um, I saw the other day that there's a bit of an inquiry about to be launched into some of these trust accounts, but literally billions of dollars have dis been disappearing out of all these Aboriginal trust accounts. And people have got no idea where they're going. Yeah. So it's a, it, it, it's, yeah, native title is, is really a nasty thing. Quite nasty. And when you when you go to Aboriginal people and you see poor people, people can't afford, you know, to buy a frying pan in a in a community, and then you see that every sec every quarter, I think it is, every quarter, is it every? Um, I think it's a quarter. They all go to a meeting and some white fella come along with a check or a cash and says, Here you are, that's yours. Or they don't give you cash at all. They come along and they say, ring you up and say, can you fill in this form and tell us what you want to buy with your money? And so they give you what they call them order forms, isn't it? Um, purchase orders, that's the correct title. They go to the Aboriginal community and say, no, no, tell us what you want and we'll write it all on a purchase order for you and you can go to the shop and buy whatever you want. But you're not allowed to buy anything else that's not on that list. And then they sh those shops will then send the bill back to the trust account and they'll pay the bill. So you're not even allowed money. Uluru is a classic example where they were getting the royalty money, but there was no royalty money, a purchase order. And I think 80% of them were given purchase orders to buy a motor car in Melbourne, a second hand motor car, two to five thousand dollars each. That's why when you're travelling around the central Australia and you're out in those outbacks, that's why you see so many Holdens and Fords and second-hand motor cars. Mate, there's, there's a whole heap of cars broken down all on the side of the road. Stacks of them. Yeah? Because they, they're not allowed to have cash. The government will not allow Aboriginal people to have cash. No. And that is a shock. It's shocking. To see it and people are starving. No, native title is not land rights and native title doesn't benefit Aboriginal people. No. We have an acronym, and some of you may have heard. The new acronym for MABO is Money Available Barristers Only. Yeah? We don't benefit. No. Sorry. Sorry to disappoint everybody, but no, we don't. I, you travel as much as I do and get out there amongst the communities to see what's going on and see the crime that's going on, the criminal activity associated with native title. Even to the point where lawyers who are employed by a native title 
and their experts, the so-called anthropologists and archaeologists, who are the experts for the United for a native title claim. All of these people under Article A, 8A mm -hmm. of the Native Title Act are exempt from having to comply with due diligence and being honest with the people and giving proper legal advice. So if the Aboriginal people lose, they are exempt from extinguishing your rights to land. So if they mislead you, misrepresent the truth, they can't be prosecuted. They're exempt from the criminal code. Whereas other lawyers are subject to that criminal code yeah, for misleading and lack of due diligence representing their, their clients. Lawyers working for in native title area don't have to worry about it. They can piss in our pocket, and they do, and misrepresent everything we want, and they do. So I'll leave you with that. Thank you.